Hello, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the National Museum of Asian Art on this beautiful summer day. My name is Emma Natalia Stein, and I'm one of the curators here at the museum. My area of focus is South and Southeast Asia. And tonight's dedicated in part to Southeast Asia with musical performances and Indonesian food outside and a major exhibition on Cambodia just downstairs. It's because of that exhibition that we're all here right now. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sonia Ree Mace. Sonia joins us from the Cleveland Museum of Art, where she conceived and developed the original presentation of Revealing Krishna, Journey to Cambodia's Sacred Mountain. It's no exaggeration to say that Sonia is a giant in our field. She has contributed major scholarship, groundbreaking exhibitions, and international partnerships for more than two decades. She also fosters the next generation of specialists by regularly lecturing and teaching in universities. Before joining the Cleveland Museum of Art, Sonia was the curator of Asian art in San Diego, where she was in charge of the renowned Edwin Binney III collection of Indian paintings. In 2008, one of her noteworthy traveling exhibitions was titled Rhythms of India, Art of Nandalal Bose organized in conjunction with the National Museum of Modern Art in New Delhi and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Sonia then became the George P. Bickford Curator of Indian and Southeast Asian Art at the Cleveland Museum in 2012. During her first two years there, she mounted the exhibition Tantra in Buddhist Art, curated the museum's collections of Indian, Southeast Asian, and Himalayan art in the newly renovated galleries, and secured a major acquisition of Mughal and Deccan paintings that became the subject of an exhibition and publication for the museum's centennial year in 2016. Sonia has been active in research, restitution, and reconstruction efforts pertaining to the Cleveland Museum of Art's important holdings of Cambodian sculpture. In 2017, her exhibition, Beyond Angkor, Cambodian Sculpture from Bante Chmar, featured a relief carving from a 12th century temple enclosure wall now housed in the National Museum in Cambodia. This unprecedented loan resulted from the signing of a cultural cooperation agreement with the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts of the Kingdom of Cambodia. Her most recent exhibition continued to deepen and build upon this relationship. For revealing Krishna, journey to Cambodia's sacred mountain, Sonia gathered a team of international specialists with expertise ranging from art history to archeology, span geology, conservation science, and technology. The exhibition and accompanying publication center on a new restoration of the museum's monumental stone sculpture, Krishna Lifting Mount Govardhan, set in the context of the site from which it came through immersive digital experiences and innovative design. Although she has deep expertise in Indian court painting, her interest in stone sculpture began with her doctoral research at Harvard. The resulting book, History of Early Stone Sculpture at Mathura, circa 150 BCE through 100 CE, provides a comprehensive analysis and chronology of the earliest known stone sculptures from the ancient cosmopolitan center of Mathura in northern India. I believe that Sonia's deep knowledge of early Indian sculpture informs her sensitive analysis and brilliant presentation of the Cambodian Krishna lifting Mount Govardhan. I'm grateful to her and her colleagues at CMA for agreeing to lend this important artwork to us in Washington, DC. Sonia's most recent research focuses on depictions of nuns and women's fertility rights in early Buddhist relief sculptures of India, and we look forward to hearing about that in the future. So for now, please join me in warmly welcoming Sonia Rimes.
Oh, thank you, Emma, for that all too gracious and flattering introduction. It is such an honor to be here in our nation's capital uh, to talk to you about this sculpture so beautifully installed downstairs in the Revealing Krishna exhibition. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you today the things that this sculpture has taught me about who this God Krishna is and has been for many people for the last 1500 years, where it came from and what it, how it was integrated into the specific land and site um, of southern Cambodia, the Mekong Delta region of peninsular Southeast Asia. And then I will conclude with talking about the role of museums and what museums do and when they work together and collaborate in order to bring forward to the public and to you all everything that we are constantly in the process of learning. So who is this beautiful male figure, gently smiling, impossibly powerful, spectacularly modeled by sculptors of, from southern Cambodia who before this time, around AD 600, scholars still are debating hotly about the date of this piece and its related, uh, the related sculptures. Uh, so we say circa 600 plus or minus 50 years, so it could be mid 6th to mid 7th century. Like I said, we still have a lot to learn. Um, but uh, this sculpture that, was, uh, that has come from southern Cambodia, who is this figure? So I'm going to start actually with some paintings because from that time period of the late 6th to early 7th century, there are actually very few examples that vividly express what Krishna meant to the people who worshipped him. So I'm starting with these two paintings, one from the Cleveland Museum of Art and one uh, from the collection here at the National Museum of Asian Art that shows Krishna in his eternal and cosmic form. And both of these images have deep roots in some of the earliest texts uh, that survive from the Mahabharata and then other texts that relay his story and discuss his nature um, over the millennia. So on the left is a depiction of Krishna as a tiny baby sucking his toe, floating on a banyan leaf right next to a sage by the name of Markandeya who had received a boon of immortality. The trouble with immortality is that you live beyond the dissolution of the universe. So once the universe is destroyed, you're there all by yourself, just, just struggling to persist in the cosmic ocean, the waters of darkness that exist, that are the only things that exist between the creation and destruction of the worlds. And so Markandeya, struggling and struggling, finally comes upon this banyan leaf floating on the waters of the cosmic ocean and sees this baby. Krishna sucking his toe, who gives him a place to rest. And then Krishna is also this powerful figure known as Vishvarupa, which means the, the, uh, the all-pervading forms. He is the form that can only be seen with a divine eye um, because it is a form that is so powerful and so intense that we can't handle it. When his devotee Arjuna is given the divine eye to see this form of Krishna in his cosmic form, and he sees everything that's ever been created just flowing out of him and back into him through time, gird in all of the gods and, and the mountains of the world. He is the form eternal that shows every the every powerful implement and is just the encompasser, maker, and destroyer of everything. So it's this kind of alpha and omega kind of um, depictions of the eternal Krishna. He's both eternal through time and he is also all powerful and existing as this enormity that is beyond all space. So this eternal being recognized as Krishna has come as a human being born into the world and with a life story. And this life story has been told by uh, in, in various uh, works of literature, poetical works, um, early ancient scriptures, and so there are numerous stories um, that, are, that, are, that are told that basically follow the same life story, but there might be different emphases and different, um, different 
points of detail, but they basically agree that he was born um, in the northern Indian city of Mathura to the wife of a demonic wicked king. Um, so his, I'm sorry, to the sister of a demonic wicked king. And in order to prevent him from being slaughtered, his father has taken him across the river under cover of night um, to be exchanged for a newborn baby that was born in a cowherder's village in the rural countryside. So here's little Krishna, shown as dark blue, um, being left with um, a, a new mother and her, the cowherder, her cowherder woman's new baby being brought back to the city of Mathura, and then Krishna grows up in this rural community. And here's a painting that shows the celebrations at the time of the birth of Krishna. It's a painting that is um, from a series associated with a poetical work, a devotional work by a saint of the 16th century by the name of Surdas. And this is just a detail from the top that shows Yashoda, so the sort of foster mother is usually what they call her, um, lying there together with the newborn baby Krishna, shown as blue, lots of hair, um, and women coming in to pay their respects. All the men are down here dancing, pouring yogurt over each other, and there's just general, general um, joy and frivolity. Now, as Krishna starts to grow up, he is so mischievous, but he's so cute and beautiful and lovable that no one really minds, um, even though his mother, Yashoda, foster mother, um, you know, threatens him with a stick while he gets into all kinds of mischief, he never really gets in trouble. So some of the earliest depictions of Krishna in sculpture that survive from about oh, no earlier than the 300s, these are difficult to date, 300s to 500s, they show, you know, these are cowherding communities, and so they earned their living off of dairy. And so they would milk the cows and then churn butter. So Yashoda is here churning butter, and Krishna has toddled over and stuck his hand into the butter pot um, in order to eat it. And this is a painting from much later, from the 18th century in South India, um, showing Krishna getting a ladder because his foster mother has hung the butter in pots from the ceiling, hoping he can't get to them up there. Um, but he has gotten up and managed to, to steal the butter anyway. So he's constantly eating. This is a common theme. I mean, it's not just that he's a little boy and little boys are always hungry. Um, there's, there are other, this is the thing about Krishna's story is that there are all these clues that point to his true nature, his true eternal cosmic nature, where he is like the embodiment of time, constantly consuming all that has been created. Um, and so he's constantly eating butter. Um, and butter also being one of the major oblations into the Vedic fire sacrifice. And so it has the roots in the earliest texts and rituals on which all forms of later Hinduism and Brahmanism have derived. Um, then throughout his youth, He's constantly beset by demon assassins whom his evil uncle Kamsa has sent in order to try uh, to kill him because the uncle has heard that Krishna will be the death of him one day. Um, and so he, has, he sends a whole series uh, of demons to try to kill Krishna as a child. They all fail. I'm just bringing one example of the whirlwind demon um, that's here in the collection, in, in the Freer collection. And this whirlwind demon has come like a tornado into town and has sort of picked up Krishna, as he's a one-year-old here, picked him up into the, into the air, uh, planning to just drop him and smash him on the ground. Um, Krishna, however, secretly makes himself so heavy that the wind can't bear him up anymore. So he alights down and is completely fine, much to the relief um, of his foster mother and the other cowherd women. So, but up to, um, and up to this point, all of his, what would be considered miracles, like making himself so heavy the wind demon can't even hold him up, they were all secret and could be explained away by some coincidence. Um, and, and then until, 
the scene of Krishna lifting Mount Govardhan, which we're about to see. Now, the episode in his story that comes right before the time when he lifts the mountain um, is this one here. And this is a painting um, from uh, the Eastern Indian state of Odisha. And it is when Krishna is playing with the other cowherd boys. And they're playing this game. I mean, it's kind of like leapfrog I guess or so what that you have to do is you have to get one of your friends um, so it's, it's a group of, of, of boys you have to put one of your friends on your shoulder and run to a designated tree and run back and whoever gets back first wins now one of Kamsa's demon assassins that he sent his name was Pralamba uh, he took the form of one of the cowherd boys and Krishna's brother Balarama who's shown as white um, was got on the back of the demon. And the demon started running off with him, and Krishna said to his brother, go ahead, you kill the demon this time. And so Balarama squeezes his head between his powerful legs and smashes his brains in. Um, so then <laughs> that's, that's the last demon of the, of the series that gets destroyed. Now, what happens after this is it happens to be the annual festival of the god Indra. So Indra is an ancient Vedic god in the early texts of, you know, 1000 BCE or so. He's the main god. He's the one who slays the dragon. He's the one who wields the thunder and lightning. He's a bit like a Zeus figure. And he was considered king of the gods. Um, but Krishna, um, is watching all of his, he's, he's eight years old at this point, he's watching all of his family and the whole community preparing all his favorite food, beautiful food, to offer to Indra uh, on the occasion of Indra's festival. And you know, they, he's saying, what, why are you offering all this fabulous food to Indra? What has Indra done for us, really? You know, you should be, you know, the main god who helps us is the god of the mountain. And here we have Mount Govardhan this the corner of it, it's in the autumn. Um, we should be offering these fabulous dishes to the god of the mountain. The mountain is the, is, the mountain god is the one who gives us all our food. It's the place where our, ca our cattle graze, we get our fresh water from the mountain. So he convinces everyone and everyone says, you're right. And so they divert all of the offerings away from Indra to the god of the mountain. Now secretly, Krishna turns himself into the god of the mountain and eats all the food. Well, so there are two Krishnas at this point, Krishna little boy Krishna and Krishna mountain god. And um, Indra becomes furious. And so he still can wield the thunderbolt and the lightning and control the storm clouds. And so he's brought all of these storm clouds, this painting from Northwestern India, where you, know, you see these kind of personifications of storm clouds in the sky and they're kind of tossing rain down on the cowherd community and everyone's miserable. Cows are drowning, all their houses are getting washed away and so they're all huddling you know, under, their, under these cloaks and Krishna says, all right, enough. And he comes over and picks up Mount Govardhan and holds it up as a shelter for the entire community. <clears throat> I'm showing you paintings from all over India in all different time periods, just so you can see the, the wide sweep of his influence. Um, so this is a painting from the Imperial Mughal Court, probably made in Lahore, which is in present-day Pakistan. Um, and it's from a text called the Harivamsha, or the genealogy of Vishnu. And Krishna is shown here holding up Mount Govardhan, and he holds it up for seven days and seven nights. So a full week, and it's raining, and it's storming, and everybody is sheltered underneath. Now, this particular scene of Krishna lifting Mount Govardhan, which is what we, this, the, the posture that we see in the sculpture downstairs, the Cambodian sculpture, is an extremely important pivotal moment in the story of the life of Krishna for several reasons. So, it's the first time that all of the people who know him understand that he's actually divine, that he's a god, that he's superhuman. Even though he seemed incredibly special <laughs> in the past, as a baby, as a child, at this point now, they can't explain this away by any coincidence or any other means. Here he is, an eight-year-old kid, holding up an entire mountain completely effortlessly for a week. And so there's no doubt that he's 
a god. And so um, priests and even are shown right here and, uh, and all the members of his community who's know, known him his entire life, they want to worship him now and Krishna will not allow it. He said, treat me as you have always treated me. Um, another thing happens and that's a turning point at this, in this episode, is he starts to become interested in girls. So everything, all the episodes prior to this are all about games, hanging out with the guys, going, you know, cow herder, cow, you know, boy games and, and slaying demons, kind of swashbuckling boy stuff. But while he's holding up Mount Govardhan, he starts to look at the gopis. Gopis are the milkmaids, the cowherd girls, uh, cowherd women. And so in paintings like this, he's effortlessly holding up this mountain. Now so effortless, he's just doing it with his pinky finger. Um, and his eyes are locked in um, the gaze with one of the, one of the women of the community, while Indra is up here in the corner, raging away, storming, <laughs> and yet, you know, everybody's feeling now pretty comfortable, even the cows. So starting to move back in time chronologically in terms of works of art, um, there, this is probably one of the earliest painted manuscript depictions of Krishna holding up Mount Govardhan. Um, and here the mountain kind of hovers above his upraised hand. He's shown with four arms, indicating that he's a god, that he's a divinity more, more than human. Um, and it's really only gopis and cows now in this, in this uh, depiction. This is from a, a poetical text, an anthology of hymns, um, and so they're all dancing, the cows are dancing, the girls are dancing, Krishna is fluting, um, and so it's a scene of joy and comfort in the midst of all that storming. Going back in time now, another couple hundred years, so that manuscript page was from the 15th century. Uh, this is a bas-relief sculpture from the 12th century from the renowned temple monument of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Um, and this is located on one of the walls of the, enclos uh, the enclosing, enclosing corridors in one of the corner pavilions. And it shows Krishna here holding up Mount Govardhan. There are cows, members of the community, um, Balarama is his brother, shown there, always his faithful sidekick. Um, and he is shown here, it's one in many episodes uh, from the life story of Krishna. And this is how uh, the scene is also shown in most Indian medieval monuments of this period, mostly in bas relief and mostly as one in a series of narratives. Now, um, what, one thing to point out here is that in Cambodia, they have these three pigtails of hair indicating that they're youths. Uh, so this is the hairstyle for children in Cambodia. It's only um, in the 8th century and earlier that we get large-scale sculptures in the round that indicate that Krishna lifting Mount Govardhan was worshipped as an icon in the sanctum of a temple in his own right. So not as, so the episode is not just one of a series of episodes of the life story of Krishna, but only this episode is kind of plucked out of his life story and his posture as holding up the mountain is the sole icon uh, for a temple sanctum. And that is the context in which the Krishna downstairs and a related Krishna from the same site in the same period um, also came. Um, these are quite monumental over life-size sculptures. Individual icons made for individual temples. And it, was, it seems to have been a, a, an important type of image or re representation of Krishna all across India and Southeast Asia between the fourth and eighth century. So it's a time when that form of Krishna was elevated to this iconic central level. So these two sculptures, they're heavily damaged, but they were found in Thailand, um, one dating to around 600 and the other to around 700, one showing Krishna as a chubbier, curly-haired youth and the other more as a royal warrior. And then, oh, one of my favorites, this one also really large, over life size, Krishna as a boy holding up the mountain. He has the long uh, pigtails of hair. He's also wearing this particular kind of necklace with tiger's teeth right here. 
um, that are, um, and this medallion that are intended, that are worn by children to ward away evil. Um, and in the Indian depictions, um, Krishna's mountain is carved as an integral component of the monolithic stone sculpture which is not how we see it in Cambodia. Um, in India, the mountain is part of the sculpture. So this sculpture was set up on the banks of the Ganges River, where there are no mountains, um, but in a temple uh, in Varanasi in northern India. And then from the, in the early 7th century down in the south of India at the rock cut site of Mamalapuram, um, there's a form of Krishna where he looks much more grown up. Um, he has a high crown um, and he is holding up the mountain much like the Cambodian Krishna does. Uh, the gopis are seen by him. And here's a view of the whole uh, tableau uh, where the cows are so comfortable now, you know, in their little shelter under the mountain that they're giving off milk and they have to be milked. Um, and here's Balarama, who's comforting uh, one of the cow herders. It's a fantastic um, bas-relief tableau of not too far off in date uh, from the Cambodian Krishna downstairs. So, after the episode of Krishna lifting Mount Govardhan, he sets it down. Indra kneels before him, admits defeat, and says, you are the Supreme One. You are omnipotent, you are omniscient, you're better than me. Um, and so, uh, and Indra then goes off chastened. So the next episode, like I said, he starts being interested in the gopis um, um, during that week under the mountain. And so that night is the first time where he stays out late and they have an erotic encounter. Um, so Krishna and all the cowherd girls, they meet at night and he plays his flute and they dance. And this is a fabulous manuscript. It's a 19th century manuscript from Assam, uh, the easternmost state of India. Um, and here, Mount Govardhan is shown, the low mountain at the left, and the next episode of Krishna fluting, and all the cowherd girls are listening, enraptured, and then they're going to dance, and then he's going to multiply himself, so every single one of them gets to dance with her own Krishna. And, <laughs> and after that, and I had to have an excuse to show this gorgeous painting in the collection here, you know, most of the scenes are about Krishna as lover, not, a, not about slayer of demons, etc. It's where he interacts with the cowherd girls uh, in a scene where, for example, he steals their saris and climbs a tree um, while they're bathing and so and he won't give them back um, <laughs> their saris until they come out of the water and show themselves naked in front of him again a reference to his true nature that we have to put aside all artifice and everything that obscures any part of us uh, and come to God completely exposed in our own truth now, there were many reenactments of the life story of Krishna. This is an example from a wonderful series, large-scale series of paintings uh, from Udaipur, uh, which is a court in Rajasthan that, um, whose wonders are going to be displayed to you all starting in November in a special exhibition here, uh, first here and then uh, next summer at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, but what's interesting, I think, in, um, for today's purposes is that this, is, uh, the, this series was, pa was painted on the occasion of Diwali, which is arguably the most, uh, the high point of the festival seasons. And uh, here's the king and all of these dancing figures are gopis and Krishna is shown wearing the, the blue shirt. Um, <laughs> and it's reenacting the life of Krishna um, with the Rasalila as, a, as the culminating component that's celebrated during the festival of Diwali. And the canopy that's shown here, so the only scene that gets a backdrop, basically, that gets a prop, is the Krishna lifting Mount Govardhan scene, where you have Indra um, in the clouds. And there's a little, in some of the paintings, there's a little Mount Govardhan um, underneath, uh, so that that particular scene can be reenacted. So this, this is just goes to show the, the central importance of that particular episode, even up into the 18th century. And then finally, I just have to mention that one of the most potent Krishna cults today is the Pushtimarg sect that follows um, this, that centers around Srinathji, um, which is 
considered by its followers to be a, the, the living presence of Krishna on earth. And it is a black stone miracle sculpture that was found on Mount Govardhan itself, a shining black sculpture of Krishna holding up Mount Govardhan. And this sculpture has now been transferred from Mount Govardhan to a Haveli in Rajasthan, in Nathdwara, um, and is constantly worshipped as the living presence of Krishna. This is what Mount Govardhan looks like today, uh, just outside of Vrindavan. So I have a little map here. Um, if you see Delhi up here in northern India, Krishna born in Mathura down here, according to the text. Vrindavan, which is where the cow herding community moved, um, is right uh, just to the northeast of Mount Govardhana itself. And Mount Govardhana itself is a wonderful pilgrimage site if you ever have a chance to go visit. There's constant pilgrims circumambulating and singing, and it's just a joyous uh, site of pilgrimage. Now from this mountain in India, let's move across the Indian Ocean and zero in on southern Cambodia um, at the site of Phnom Da, which is another little mountain, but now in uh, southern Cambodia in this Mekong River Delta region. And at the time when the Krishna sculpture was made, the major metropolis or city associated um, very closely to the mountain uh, is called Angkor Bure, which means in Khmer, capital city. So it was the capital city of the seat of power of the region 1,500 years ago. And this is what Phnom Dha looks like today. Um, it's a two-peaked mountain. And we say mountain because that's how we translate the word Phnom, um, but it's more like outcropping <laughs> or a hill, uh, but they're rocky, and the whole landscape is otherwise completely flat. It's like it's a floodplain. It's half the time it's like below sea level <laughs> and underwater completely. Um, and so these rocky eminences uh, were, were considered sacred places, and Phnom Da in particular seems to have had special uh, sacred potency to the population, even before the Krishna temples um, and related sculptures were established. So on Phnom Da were found these eight monumental sandstone sculptures, all over life size, all gorgeously carved, absolutely spectacular, in a style that is distinctively Khmer, so different from what we saw in India. Iconographically, they're related, but stylistically, they're really local. They're very much a regional style. And they are considered to be the beginning of the stone sculptural tradition in Cambodia, and also considered to be its pinnacle, that for sculpture, the Phnom Da style is considered to be the highest. It's like it started with this first flush of inspiration and talent. And it continued to be fabulous, but somehow the naturalism and power of these early Phnom Da sculptures are all, will be unparalleled. And as time goes on, it seems like there was more attention given to monumental works of stone architecture and less, less care given towards the centrality of individual sculptural icons in comparison to this early period where the architecture was mostly all brick um, and stone uh, was uh, the stone was primarily reserved for the icons in the sanctum. And this, st this particular sandstone was really special. It is not a local sandstone. It was imported from we don't know where, but it could be really far away because everything is connected by waterways. But we know that it was specially sought after since it is nothing like any of the stone in the region. So all eight of these large-scale gods were found on this two-peaked mountain. So. These two Hariharas were found on the southwestern peak, which is a slightly lower peak. So we're not going to talk about those too much today because they're kind of their own thing. But on the northeastern peak of Phnom Da, on the top is an eight-armed Vishnu, which can be interpreted as his all-powerful form. And then in five caves, that are man-made caves um, on the side of the mountain, the northeastern peak of the mountain, were five avatars or incarnations of Vishnu on Earth. So it's like, the, it's like on, in the structural temple on the top of the mountain was the, the cosmic form of, of God. And then in the Earth itself, in cave temples, were his forms as they are on Earth, right? So human forms on Earth. 
So here's a view of the temple at the top of the mountain as it looks today. Um, the roof collapsed here and buried that huge nine foot tall Vishnu under the rubble. So it wasn't known at all until, uh, until 1935 and uh, when it, the, the temple was cleared out. Now this form of the temple was expanded in the 11th century. It was, it was smaller and made only of brick um, in, in the 7th century when, uh, when the Vishnu was first installed. So this is the view of the top of Phnom Da. Inside the temple, after it was cleared out, there's this massive pedestal that the Vishnu once stood upon. And I have a little video here to show him all around, it'll turn, um, start turning like this. So we had all eight of the gods of Phnom Da projected in 3D models. We had four of them on loan um, as stone sculptures, but thanks to our cooperation, we were able to get permission to take beautiful 3D scans and photogrammetry of all eight gods of Phnom Da, so we could reunite them digitally, and they're all available on our website. Um, but it's a spectacular sculpture with unparalleled types of weapons and implements in his hand. The shining and dark quality of the stone is the way Krishna's body once looked. So the, he's lighter colored as we see him today, but that's because of weathering. Um, this Vishnu is actually protected under all of the bricks that collapsed upon it. And it was broken into 100 pieces, and it's all been skillfully put together by the conservation team at the National Museum of Cambodia, where it can be seen today. Now I'll just draw your attention down here to the feet, they're lighter in color because they're the only part of the sculpture that was not buried under the rubble. So it looks like it was collapsed by vandals probably, you know, at, well after the expansion. The expansion happened in the 11th century, probably in the 13th or 14th century. The sculpture was toppled because there's gold and gems as part of the consecration treasure kept under the pedestal itself. And they threw the feet with the tenon below down the hillside. And so the feet were weathered, exposed to the elements for several hundred years in order to achieve this le level of weathering. So that's why we know that the site was, uh, was first destroyed, basically, and abandoned um, at the, probably the 13th or 14th century. Now halfway up the north side of the peak um, are, are three caves that face north. These are two of the three. They actually face the same direction. This is a wide angle lens, so it's a little distorted. Um, but these are two caves. Um, we call them Cave E and Cave D. It's from the French um, archaeologist who went there in 1911 and kind of gave these arbitrary letter designations, but we'll stick with them to, um, so we don't uh, cause confusion. So this is halfway up the mountain. These caves face the same direction as the Vishnu temple on the top. They face directly towards the city and the king's palace. Now, cave E uh, is this one right here. And inside are three slabs that were part of the pedestal um, on which the icon once stood. And here's a view from the inside. So standing in the back of the cave, this would have been the sanctum of the temple. And we see here one big slab made of schist um, that has a long spout on it for um, ablutions that would be then collected for distribution to the faithful. It was looks like it was taken off the initial um, stack here here um, because there's one slab that's probably missing and they would have all piled up. This would have been the top slabs. The lower slabs are made of sandstone. Now, our conservator made a model of the tenon. This was in the Cleveland Museum of Art. And so we made um, a foam model of this part of the tenon that sits into the pedestal. And it fits exactly the mortise hole of the top of the pedestal in cave E. So assuming that no one moved these <laughs> like half ton slabs of stone, they were really, really big. Um, that they, you know, assuming no one moved this from a totally different cave temple or temple somewhere else, um, we can deduce that whoever was standing on these feet was the divinity worshipped in this cave. Um, and that would be 
the Krishna sculpture, Krishna lifting Mount Govardhana, that is in the National Museum of Cambodia in Phnom Penh. So I'm going to call him the Phnom Penh Krishna for the sake of clarity. So this was actually the main avatar. He's directly below Vishnu, he's the central of the five caves, and he would have stood here. So we think. That's the best evidence we have. Um, and then the adjacent cave, known as Cave D, it still has the sandstone facade, so Cave E would have had a facade like this as well. Um, and so the sandstone was built into the facade, and there are these um, slabs in front that were part of a doorway that was part of a brick vestibule that was built in front of the cave. So the caves would have looked more like structural temples originally. Um, and inside, they've recently put a new floor of tile and a concrete altar, so that's really new. Um, this is the first photograph that was taken of this cave in 1911 uh, by a French archaeologist, and it's the first photograph taken at Phnom Dat all. It's a glass plate, and it's in terrible condition. Someone, like, put their finger on it, and I don't know what they had for lunch, but the, th the thumbprint is still there. Um, <laughs> it obscures what's left of the brick uh, wall of a vestibule, um, and so basically the local population, you know, they're great bricks, and so they would use them for other purposes, so they're pretty much gone now, except for some that are still way at the top. But this, at this time, uh, the doorway, the door jam into the vestibule was still standing, so you can see um, that it's there. And note here, this is 1911, um, there are Chinese characters here. A new community of Vietnamese Buddhists moved to the site sometime between 1900 and 1910. Uh, the last description we have, report that we have from the site is from 19, someone who went there in 1900, and there was no evidence of any community living there. But by 1911, when Parmentier went, they had moved there, and they had cleared out this cave, which the previous report of this cave, the very first actually, no photograph, but description, second-hand description of a Mr. Pierre Silvestre, who was, the, who was the director of the botanical gardens in Saigon. He went exploring on Phnom Da, and he saw, and he describes this very specifically, this, a, a cave with these, this sandstone wall and the, this, a gateway with right angles, and he said, but scree, um, filled it up about halfway up the doorway, and it was full of debris inside, um, and it was home to thousands of bats, and the combination of guano and water dripping from above has made it such that whatever mysterious and bloody rites took place in the cave are now, no evidence is all thoroughly um, invisible. <laughs> um, but by the time, so that was 1880, um, anyone who went there, there are two other people who went there, in, who wrote about it, um, <laughs> it was in 1882 and then 1900, they didn't see this cave, they only went to the structural temples, um, and, or the other side of the mountain. Um, but in 1911, when Parmentier went, what had happened was this Vietnamese Buddhist community had come and they cleared out this cave of all the guano and dirt and mess and they were going to repurpose it as a Buddhist shrine for their community. And, um, he, and they had placed in the back a sculpture um, that, that was, well, I'll tell you in a second about what it was, um, and that there had been another sculpture that was found that the villagers told the priest who told Parmentier was there and, it was, and they had it lying outside, but it was gone. So we think this is probably the cave of the Cleveland Krishna. Um, now, would the Cleveland Krishna actually fit in this cave? And so when we went there in 2019, um, our Cambodian team um, and I took thorough measurements of the cave and found that in the ceiling of the cave, there's this kind of overhanging notch left in the, left in the ceiling, the rock cut ceiling. Um, and then b back from that, um, there's a notch carved into, like a kind of runway carved into the ceiling that gets higher and higher and higher. And the difference in height winds up being the difference in height of the standard pedestal um, of the time. And so we took all these measurements of the back, of the front, of the width, and the width would easily accommodate the width of uh, Krishna's upper slab. 
So it is possible, but then how could they get a monolithic sculpture that's taller than the entranceway into the cave? So we did it, this is a draft, so forgive us that it's not perfect yet, but it gives some sense of how they managed to do it. Um, this, was, uh, this was developed in consultation with Cambodian conservators um, who have studied uh, the process. So they would fill up a ramp made of soil, take bamboo poles, and people would be on either end rolling the poles and pushing um, from the front um, this monolithic sculpture of Krishna all the way to the back of the cave. Um, and the pedestal, as you see, is already in place. And so you set the bottom of the tenon over the mortise hole of the pedestal. And then you start adding wedges into the back um, to start slowly, slowly tilting it up. Um, these are banana trunk planks that are there kind of like padding, like we would use foam padding so that the, it doesn't scrape, the sculpture doesn't scrape the pedestal below. So slowly you have wedges, people with ropes pulling from the front, and then as it gets to the top, you use beams to slowly push it up and up. And then, the t so that's why you have to carve that notch out in the back of the ceiling so that there's enough clearance for the tenon to get up over the pedestal and then sink in. And then there's the overhanging notch in front that that just comes to the height of the top of the, of the upper stele. And in that way, it gives Krishna this kind of built-in look. So he looks like a pillar in the middle of the cave. And you can circumambulate the sculpture, and the uh, waters of ablution can be poured over his head, flow out of that spout. Um, and then the sandstone facade is added, and this is how we believe Krishna looked um, as he was installed in the cave. So this is a wonderful new way that no other site has depicted a Krishna Govardhana like this, um, really built into the mountain, in the mountain that he holds up himself. Um, and then we were able to project this um, using HoloLens um, headsets so that you could actually walk into the cave and circumambulate it yourself and see how the water poured over the head could flow out of the spout. So that's how we understand that these two Krishnas, made by probably the same artists around the same time in the same place, um, were installed side by side in adjacent temples, but each in his own temple. So why are there two Krishnas? You know, what's the difference between these two Krishnas? So the Phnom Penh Krishna that you see on your left, it's a little bit smaller than the Cleveland Krishna that you see on the right. Um, here's a close-up of his face. Um, and if you notice his hair, um, it's covered with this dark lacquer and a little bit of gilding um, that was applied in the 1920s uh, when he became worshipped as a Buddha. Um, but he, um, he has this child's hairstyle with the three pigtails like uh, we saw at Angkor Wat. Here's a view of the top. So there's the pigtails themselves are broken. They're, you know, they would have been long and thin so they break off easily. Um, so, but these top knots were secured by these rings. So there are one, two, and three of them which is the child's hairstyle. There's the one on his left side. This is just like we saw at Angkor Wat. They would have stuck up like that. Um, but the Cleveland Krishna has the hairstyle of a mature person prince or a warrior, a member of the warrior class, which is ringlets of hair, um, and the, at the top um, is one, one um, pigtail of hair that's then cur uh, curled back and secured uh, by a, another golden, uh, golden ring. And that's a mature boy or man's hairstyle of the time period. The great Vishnu from the top of the mountain has those same rows of ringlets with the little bangs in the front. Um, and here's another video from our 3D model of Rama. So the other incarnation of Vishnu uh, besides Krishna that was uh, previous to Krishna. And we can see how it looks in the back. It's more well preserved uh, than the Cleveland Krishna version. Just beautiful heavy rows of ringlets falling over the nape of his neck. So I think what we have going on here is, again, something completely unique to the Cambodian presentation of the Krishna's lifting Mount Govardhan, where we have Krishna as a child and Krishna as a man. And I, as I described earlier, uh, he 
came of age while he was holding up that mountain for seven days, where he went from being a boy interested in childhood games and killing demons to being a lover of the gopis. So here's an aerial view of Phnom Dan. Here's Vishnu's temple at the top, facing north this way. The two Krishnas would have been directly underneath down here. And um, the, this is a tank of water that's an ancient reservoir that would have been, there's a canal that went up here um, leading directly to Angkor Bure, the city. So you'd get off um, by boat and bathe, cleanse yourself before entering the sacred site. This is the, a modern monastery building, but you would enter the site from the east. So this is the, the eastern, um, the east, the reservoir marking the beginning of your approach to the site. The first cave faces due east, probably held Rama in it as their earlier incarnation. And then you go up the hill, and then there are the three caves facing north. Um, the first one, I think, had Balarama, his brother, and then the two Krishnas, but first the young Krishna, and then the older Krishna. So that makes sequential sense in terms of time. And then you head up the mountain to see Vishnu in all his glory. Now, how did Krishna get down from the mountain? <laughs> Um, it happened before 1911 uh, because this sculpture, the Cleveland Krishna, was not there when Parmentier arrived. And um, by, by 1920, we know that it was in the collection of Leonce Rosenberg, who is a Parisian art dealer, who was a champion of Cubism, and this was the only Cambodian sculpture in his collection. It sold um, for the equivalent of today, in today's money, $800,000, uh, to the, a banking family called the Stokeleys, Adolphe and Suzanne Stokeley. Of course, at this time, they had no idea who he was. Um, they're just calling him a personage, um, and the Stokeleys called him their dancing prince. And they put him on center stage in their music hall. It's like their private home theater. And when they would have musical and dance performances, they'd drag him off stage, and then he'd come back on stage again in between performances. So he lived the lush life here in Brussels, Belgium, in this gorgeous Art Nouveau mansion. Meantime, what happened to the other Krishna? So what seems to have happened is that the Cleveland Krishna torso uh, was being prepared for transformation into a Buddha image. So being prepared to be reused, to be recarved into a Buddha image. When it was taken away, anecdotally, by a French sailor um, from Saigon, who took him then to Marseille and traded him for a motorbike um, with Leon's Rosenberg, um, <laughs> this then, this Krishna from the neighboring cave was being used instead. Um, so this is before the shoulders and the left arm were cut down. Uh, Parmentier describes the ray arm is still being there. Um, it was lying when, in 1911 in the back of Cave D, and this is what happened to it. Um, so he got, this is the Phnom Penh Krishna, the one with the three pigtails. Um, he got the, his arms completely cut off at the shoulders and also chiseled down on the chest so that the neck could be elongated, and then um, um, you know, both legs completely cut off so that it could be covered with plaster and lacquer and gilding and turned into a Buddha image. But I think there's still this idea of a continuity of a sacred sculpture, but now, but you know, the, it was broken at the bottom of the cave, completely covered with, with mess, you know, guano and dust and dirt and debris, and so now reused as, as a Buddha image for um, the cult of the new uh, community there. Now, in 1944, uh, this sculpture was identified by personnel from the National Museum of Cambodia in Phnom Penh and brought to Phnom Penh, and all the lacquer and gilding were removed, except they couldn't get it out of his hair, so it's still black, and put him um, on view in the galleries, uh, just like this. This is a photograph just after it was cleaned. And then they made a plaster, but before that, actually, before cleaning it all off, they made a plaster cast of the sculpture, because apparently it was considered the most sacred sculpture in the region. And they reinstalled the plaster cast onto the altar in Cave D. Um, and this is the only photograph that exists of the plaster cast of the Phnom Penh Krishna transformed into a Buddha. And this was blown up by the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s, so that all evidence of Buddhist, uh, of Buddhist practice on Phnom Dha was wiped out uh, during uh, the 
the period of the Khmer Rouge in 75 to 79. So these two Krishnas, okay, so <laughs> this one in Cave D, I think they, the community were looking to use Cave D as a Buddha shrine because that's the only one that had the sandstone facade and the doorway. So it was the best one to choose as the shrine. They started um, to cut the legs off of the Krishna. It was already probably fallen down because it was also va vandalized, you know, in the 13th or 14th century to get the consecration treasure. It had probably broken somewhat on the bottom of the floor, being covered with dirt and debris. Um, and, but it then became cut further uh, because the, the stone torso was going to be set into the plaster crossed legs of a seated Buddha. But that is when the French sailor came to the site. He didn't leave, leave any records or publish any records. Um, and he took it away to France before there was time to cut down the shoulders and the elevated arm. Um, and then um, between 1911 and 1921, this um, the Phnom Penh Christian the sculpture was cut down and then transformed um, as you just saw. Now, in 1935, there was a campaign of clearing at the site where a bunch of arms and legs were found. Arms and legs that were just in a heap, like a discard heap of, of stone pieces. There are 14 pieces, and Mojé, who was the, the archaeologist who found them, thought, oh, it must belong to the Stokely Krishna in Brussels because he doesn't have any arms and legs. And so he packed them all up in crates, and they were sent to Brussels, Belgium. But in the process, they broke the top slab and the lower slab into multiple pieces. So the upper slab with hand, as you'll see downstairs, is mended they, in order to fit it in the boxes. So they broke this in half, this slab into three pieces, um, and sent them all to Brussels. And then in Brussels, they tried to put it together, um, but dissatisfied, they abandoned the effort and buried the pieces in the garden. Um, and this was the garden of Stokely's neighbors. Um, and the sculpture, just the torso, as was insisted especially by Mrs. Stokely, um, went back on the stage just as is and as it had been. Um, it remained um, in the Stokely family until 1973 when Sherman Lee, uh, the director of the Cleveland Museum of Art, bought it for the museum. Now, Stan Chuma, who was my predecessor as the curator at the Cleveland Museum of Art, had read in early reports about the discovery of all these limbs at Phnom Da. And so he went and after a long time of trying to figure out what happened to them, discovered which garden the fragments were buried in. And in this photo, it's a terrible photo, but you can see one of Krishna's thighs sticking out of the edge of the garden. And so he ordered an excavation of the garden, um, <laughs> promising that the museum would pay to replant everything just as it was. And they dug it all up and found all 17 pieces. He sent them all to Cleveland, and there they are just after they were unpacked, and did the best they could in 1977 to 1978 to reconstruct the Krishna, the Cleveland Krishna, putting him on the legs and the feet that they felt worked the best. So that meant that there were, uh, that there were I think, nine fragments that weren't used. Um, and so this you see Stan in storage here with the, with the upper stele with hand. And all those fragments got sent to Cambodia in 2005 to be attached to the other, the Phnom Penh Krishna torso. And so on the right is how you see it was reconstructed from 2005 until 2015. And then, in 2014, Bertrand Porte, um, who is the uh, French conservator with the EFEO, the Ecole Francaise d'Extreme Orient, they had a me memorandum of understanding with the National Museum in Phnom Penh uh, that he would train Cambodian conservators to take care of the sculptures in the collection. He noticed that there were some issues <laughs> with the restorations, that like the tenon in the back of the hand didn't fit the back of the Phnom Penh uh, sculpture, and that there were issues with, you know, there's this huge huge fill here, attaching the hip of Krishna to the leg and this knee. And so we made some scans 
Uh, we took uh, 3D model scans of all of the pieces of the Krishna. This is how it was installed, and here's our Hanuman before um, Cleveland uh, transferred it back to Cambodia. Um, made 3D printouts and to see how the handpiece would work with the Cleveland Krishna torso. It took us two years to take that restoration apart because they used epoxy and steel in the 70s. They never expected it would ever need to come apart. Uh, we were able to get scans and photogrammetry of the underside of the Phnom Penh Krishna in Cambodia, and then using mesh mixer software, put the two scans together and see that the upper right leg that was in Cleveland matched perfectly with the groin, the lower right groin of the Phnom Penh Krishna. And so we effected an exchange uh, where we sent all of those pieces, <laughs> packed them up, sent them back to Cambodia um, after making sure, using the 3D models, how the pieces should all go. Um, and they created completed the, the new restoration with the correct pieces on the Phnom Penh Krishna. Um, and then this piece that had been on the Phnom Penh Krishna, this lower leg piece, they sent back to Cleveland um, because it belongs to the Cleveland Krishna. So we had limbs flying back and forth. <laughs> more than once uh, between Cleveland and Phnom Penh. Um, but in our exhibition, um, in the Cleveland iteration, we were able to show both sculptures side by side, all finally with their correct limbs. <laughs> and we used a lot of digital elements to explain the stories. And I'll just show you this short video that the, uh, the museum prepared. And now we're so honored to have the piece here at the National Museum of Asian Art, where the story of everything this sculpture has been through for the last 1,500 years can be shared with new audiences and so beautifully installed as this focus of this exhibition. But you know, we are still in the infancy of our understanding. This exhibition is not at all the last word on the matter. Um, it was, in fact, I would consider it really the beginning of an exploration because it just, you know, the work of the museum was to establish, well, what pieces actually all came from this site. Before this exhibition, the eight sculptures had never been published in the same place altogether before. They were scattered, so little was known, only D descriptions of style. Um, so little was known about how they were all built into the monument, to the site, to the mountain itself. And so I hope that this helped, it helped me anyway, um, understand the importance of the moment of Krishna lifting the mountain and what it could have meant for the people of Cambodia first adopting this new religion um, in their land, how they integrated it and spent such monumental, unimaginable care in the creation of the image of this god and his related divine family. Um, and museums are able to join in cooperating with one another to expend their resources, to generate research so that we can see what our ancestors were capable of accomplishing and what really mattered to them in the whole scheme of the whole life story of Krishna. Um, and to then be able to share it in compelling ways with the world. So I thank you so much for your time today and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>
So I'll repeat the question very succinctly for the sake of the recording and anyone who didn't hear it. Um, but that, uh, our, the question drew attention to the extraordinary similarities that we see sometimes between elements of, of mythologies where, for example, Moses was floated down the river to escape slaughter. Krishna, too, had to be brought across the river to escape slaughter. Have there been any studies comparing the connections among them? Um, so, okay, I'm an art historian, I'm afraid. That I wish there were, I don't perhaps there are some scholars of comparative religions. Um, so first I'll, I'll say that there are very clear correlations between, for example, Greek deities and, and those of India. Zeus and Indra are very clear cognates. Um, now the Semitic um, stories and the Vedic or Hindu Brahmanical stories, that's a little bit harder to to connect necessarily there could be an element of coincidence it's hard to know what came which came first um, you can't really trace a direct cause or like that a direct influence um, it's just really great to constantly draw attention to these similarities and then see if any evidence arises in the future. Um, there are certain elements that I think um, have been well discussed, especially the floods um, in the laws of, of, of Manu and the early floods and that these themes of the flood. I'm sorry I don't have references off the tip of my tongue, but I'm sure there have, there, I do know there have been um, excellent studies on these. Um, Deborah, do you have any suggestions for comparative mythologies? <laughs> okay, yeah, right. So, thank you. Another question? Yes, in the back. The Vishnu is, all, they're all sandstone. So all eight gods are all sandstone. It's better preserved. Um, the weathering has caused um, the, the Krishna to have gotten dull. Um, but there are areas that are better preserved on Krishna where you can see it was once completely highly polished. Now, you do though draw attention to, to an important distinction, is that the, the Vishnu and one of the Hariharas actually are a slightly different kind of sandstone that has more mica in it. So it does have a little more of a glittering quality than six of the others. And the other six are absolutely identical sandstone um, and also identical to the door jams and the, um, the pedestals. And we still don't know the source. So the height of the Vishnu, yes, the Vishnu is the only one that is significantly taller than all the others. So the, the Vishnu, not including its base and pedestal, is about nine feet tall, and the other, all the other figures are about six feet tall. Yeah. Yes? So the question is, from, uh, from where would the expertise to carve the stone have come from? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It is so extraordinarily well done. It is, these are monoliths, you know. The, the back plates are connected by means of bridges to the, to the body itself. These arches, these are all not seen anywhere else. Um, so we can only speculate. And even, even, you know, the style of carving is not directly influenced from anywhere in a way that, uh, that we can particularly identify. So it's a mystery still, un still unknown. Yes? Yes. Yes, that's right. So, uh, so monumental stone sculpture started emerging in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Java, 
somewhat, um, but mostly uh, I think uh, mainland Southeast Asia during the same time period. So Phnom Da is the first site with this monumental stone sculpture in Cambodia, but yes, in Thailand and Laos, the same uh, was taking place. And, uh, and there have not been the same kind of precise stone analyses that have been done on the Phnom Da sculptures. It was really our project that created the opportunity for um, a scientific analysis of all of the pieces, because we had to identify all the stone pieces. We were hoping that individual uh, you know, sculptures would have a certain signature so we could match fragments to the body, the right fragments to the bodies using that way, but it didn't help because they're all the same stone. So, um, but yes, yeah, but I think that that could be very interesting to see if in CTAP, Dravati, if they're using the same kind of sandstone. I suspect it's not the same stone, um, but in terms of techniques of carving, yeah, I think there could be some very important and fruitful further research. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? Is there? Yes. Okay. So the question was, Krishna has such a classical feel to him, and could there be any connections with Gandhara? So I think that's, that's a wonderfully insightful question. Um, and I think what most art historians would attribute, oh, they would, yes, agree and say, yes, he has these classic proportions and naturalism and gentle modeling um, that is probably more related to Gupta sculpture in India that is considered to be the high point of class, what we call classical sculpture in, in India that grew out from the Gandharan period. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's a direct connection with Gandhara to Phnom Da, but very indirectly via the sculptures of Gupta India, um, northern India in particular, um, and that also in the post-Gupta period uh, can be seen in Ajanta and sites on the west coast. Those are what have filtered over to Phnom Da somehow. We don't know for sure the mechanism of how that worked, but there certainly is a classic feel. <laughs> Thank you, that was so beautiful. And I think that what this talk showed us also is that beyond, even beyond an exhibition, what the benefits can be of a kind of sustained study of a site, of an object, that the exhibition, as you, you so beautifully said, can be not the end point, but even a beginning to a larger project and a larger set of questions and new, new research, new information. Um, and new possibilities and opportunities. So thank you so much. Um, Sonia and I will both be in the exhibition, Revealing Krishna, down one level now for probably the next hour or so, and we'd be happy to, to talk more um, in the galleries. So thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening.